Bam. I am Eric Grojo, and I am with the Breaking Down News Show. That's right. The Breaking Down Show brings you a guy named Eric Grojo who you've probably never heard of before. And I think you're going to love who he is, what he's done. Uh, I, Your resume, my man, holy cow. What have you not done that you wish you would have done? Because we can get into everything, but like, like you know what I should have done with the turn I should have made? What's out there that was left undone that you should have got to? Well, you know, just to answer your question, I am beginning a new life as a farmer in Maine, which I haven't done that before. Right. And as a maniac, as we call ourselves in the military aviation, somebody said, you have lived a very interesting life. And I said, no, I am living an interesting life. We haven't finished yet. Yeah. Tired Colonel. Obviously, you've got a very uh, a distinct accent. What's your background? My father is Mexican. My mother is maniac from, we go back to uh, Civil War soldiers, uh, Revolutionary War soldiers, uh, Mayflower founders, uh, Irish immigrants. So you slice the Mexican side or the American side. Of course, I'm married to a uh, professor in Mexico, and I lived there for the last eight years. So while we speak English at home, I'm quite sure that the accent has carried and it will carry for some time until I'm more resettled in Maine. It's a question that fascinates me when I talk to folks, especially if you've got different backgrounds. You know, we, we often take a very short view of history. And I know you know a lot about history. You know a lot about international relations. You've been all over the world. When do you belong to somebody or something? Like you, you live in Maine. You have uh, roots from Mexico. You have deep, deep, deep roots for the United States. But some people would say, well, you're not an American because you're not native. But how could you be anything but native? Your family has been here for generations upon generations. When is somebody from somewhere? When, when can you legitimately say you are this? Like, you can't call me a Caucasian. I can't go to the Caucasus region and claim anything. I'm not, I'm not from there. There's no, I have no historical tie that I can find that takes me to, you know, the Asian European border Ural mountain area. Oh, that's because you haven't dug up enough. But, you know, we all have the same roots from everywhere else. When you look at, at our family tree, the moment you go from grandparents to great-grandparents to great-great-grandparents, suddenly it opens up an incredible mushroom. And, uh, you know, it'll be a long time before we tie everything. But, you know, technically a native is somebody born in a place. And, uh, but we, ha we have something that bothers me. In the United States, we call the uh, what we're called Indians Native Americans. They're not native, no, no more than you and I, because we were born here. Yeah. So native is anybody who was born in the United States, in the Americas. There were earlier immigrants because they came from Asia. Yeah. And they, came, they started coming 12,000 years ago in different waves. You know, so identity politics is dumb because maybe... If you want to know where somebody's from, mm. to learn the history, to learn the customs, to learn the food, but to try to segregate us on the basis of who our parents and grandparents were, it is dumb and really impossible because, especially in the United States, we're a mix of, of everything, or as somebody said once, and I agree, we're mongrels. Yeah, yeah. And truly, everybody's a mongrel. You might have a, a long time in your lineage that you don't bother to check out that has you in one area. But like you said, you came from somewhere else. And the more we dig, you mentioned digging, the more we dig here in North America, the more we find out, well, eh, 12,000 years ago, let's, uh, let's 10x that because there's, there's finds here in San, Di San Diego. They found an elephant carcass that had been butchered, and it dates 100,000 year, 100, years back. So, yep. so and that doesn't surprise me. That seems reasonable that like, yeah, you know what? There's been people here as long as there's been people. Yeah. So, but as far as we know today, yeah. most human beings sprung out of somewhere in East Africa, although other humanoids sprung out somewhere else. We haven't found an, a humanoid, a humanoid that originates in the Americas. So it's either Africa, Asia, or the Neanderthals in Europe. And as far as I know, we all have a little bit of Neanderthal in ourselves, even though we consider somebody who's dumb a Neanderthal, but we have to be careful who we try to call dumb. Yeah. 
And also, uh, some of us have, still have Denisovan DNA in us, which is yes. we're just starting to understand that we don't know the first thing about that particular group of people, and uh, and they're not Neanderthals. They are a different, a different, I guess you would say, genus. You know, altogether. I don't know. I mean, probably the same phyla, but somewhere along the line, there's a different branch, and some people have that branch, and that means that there's a lot we don't know. Exactly, and. Uh... What you just said is the most important thing. What we don't know is infinitely greater than what we know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And boy, <laughs> that's show over. That's perfect right there. Hey, give us some background professionally with you. And then I want to dive into some some of the political, geopolitical, not policy-based things, but I want to dive into some of that. But just kind of give us a brief bio so folks can understand the power of your intellect and your experience. Well, let, let's go back to my early childhood when I spent time in, in Old Town Lane with my grandparents and my mother. My parents were divorced. My father married a, a young, beautiful woman that talked him into leaving my mother. But that's uh, family secrets. <laughs> Not really. And, uh, but at some point, my father moved with her to Cuba. And uh, my sister and I stayed in Mexico. But eventually, my father sent for us. Uh, this was December of 1958. Why is that important? Because we arrived in Cuba technically on a month vacation from school. But uh, 27 days later, the Cuban government fell and Fidel Castro took over. So I say that was my first revolution, be able to witness that transition and see the euphoria of the Cuban people having gotten rid of a bloody dictator and, uh, and replaced by somebody that everybody had great faith in, although my father's father-in-law said, eh, this guy is like a watermelon. He's green on the outside and red on the inside, which proved to be true. Spent three years in Cuba against my will. I really didn't want to stay. I didn't want to be there, but I learned to adapt. So I adapted, I made friends. I didn't want to go to regular school, so my father sent me to, uh, to commercial school where I learned something that at the time I didn't think had any value. I learned to type. So now with computers, having learned to type then, um, even though I'm a dinosaur in terms of computers, I can, I, I can use a keyword reasonably well. So that was a benefit from that education. I became uh, from pro-Castro to anti-Castro. I was arrested a couple of times as a teenager for opposing the regime until such point as my father took me out of the town we were in, uh, took me to hide in into Havana until the whole family was able to leave Cuba and go back to Mexico with the clothes we had on. And so back in Mexico, I, I rejoined the regular school, went to junior high school, went to high school, and then decided it was time for me to come to Maine, to where it's home. So I came to Maine, finished high school in Old Town High School, went to the University of Maine, and uh, wanted to be a nuclear physicist. Not good for me. I'm a politician. So I didn't do well in math and in so forth. So I had to drop out in my freshman year so I could then enter again in uh, arts and sciences. Well, lo and behold, I got my draft notice in two weeks. Later on, I found out that the lady who run the draft board was the mother of a young lady I was dating, and she didn't want me near her daughter. So in those days, the draft board controlled who got drafted, which is during Vietnam. So I joined the Army, signed up for OCS. In OCS, uh, they gave us a helicopter ride, and they said, you want to fly these things? I said, yes, but this is the Air Force. No. It's the Army. So anyway, fast forward, I graduate, go to flight school, and January 69, I'm in Vietnam. I spent a year in Vietnam flying helicopters off to Germany and an artillery unit out of Germany, back to Maine after the, the, the rift, joined the National Guard. And that made me do something that turned out to be very interesting. In a military career, you normally have a one-line career. But 
between active army, national guard, aviation, the reserves. I've been infantry, artillery, special forces, medical service corps, helicopter pilot, international affairs, until I ended up going to Venezuela as an advisor from the chief of army reserve to help Venezuela organize its army reserve just before Hugo Chavez decided to have his first coup. An important thing that was accomplished then, it was an, a reserve unit that came to active duty and stopped the coup along with other people. So that was an accomplishment in support of democracy, even though Hugo Chavez got elected. So I spent, at the end of my career, I was in the Pentagon after the War College, did 31 years, and then went on to civilian life. In the interim, I spent uh, the second Reagan administration at the Department of Energy in charge first of the security of nuclear weapons uh, industrial complex. And once we accomplished that mission for the secretary, he moved my boss, who's a retired Marine Colonel, a super American hero, to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy for energy emergencies. So there we, we dealt with problems like the New York blackout, the grid, which is something that he renovated and we still have problems with today. And after that, I retired. I went to work with Ed in the private sector and a very interesting contract that happened after 9-11. Like you said, we never intended to be anti-terrorist or security specialists. It's something you stumble into. And uh, so the company that we had bid on a contract, well, they had a contract which they put me bid on, and we actually did a security survey for the state of New York of all of its energy industries and the chemical industry to make sure that New York State was ready for the next hit, whatever that is. And interesting stories that are, that are around that. So after that, we began to do risk evaluations of uh, pipelines, uh, refineries. I began to go to Mexico with uh, several clients. I began to teach. And in one of those trips, as a, as an international affairs specialist, I was invited to a conference, met my wife, and uh, she made eyes at me. I answered back. And uh, so we got together. We've mar been married for eight years. And now it's time to leave Mexico. So uh, I bought a farm in Maine. And I have a petition for my wife and the kids to uh, come to the U.S. as legal immigrants. So that puts me where we're today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lot of stuff, man. And, and I'm glad we took time doing it. And you really kind of glossed over a lot of things that we could get into. I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on your bio because, uh, you know, what we're talking about now, I think, is more important. One of the things you are doing is running for office for what, state senate. Is that right in Maine? That is correct. Before I left for Washington, I have been very active in the Republican Party in Maine. I was a member of the, of the state committee. I work with... Uh, uh, Bill Cohen, when he was mayor of the city of Bangor until he was a senator. And I was in Africa when he became secretary of defense. So I didn't participate in that part of, of his uh, upward mobility, but I was very engaged. So when I came back to Maine, the first thing I did was uh, reincorporate myself into the Republican Party. And they sent me a survey and they said, would you be willing to run for office? I said, yeah, I think I have an exit experience. And uh, so then they came back and said, well, there's a vacancy in this district, which is where I live, because of the uh, uh, redistricting after the, uh, the census. So I said, yes. So here I am running for the state senate in a blue state that we're going to turn red. And like I tell my, my fellow candidates and my fellow GOPers, if we don't win this year, we will never win. So... The Republican Democrat stuff aside, because, you know, that's that's one thing. I'm not all that interested in that. What I'm really interested in is one of the and we talked about this yesterday on the phone. One of the hallmarks of a good leader is to be able to build consensus. Now, in the military, you can be a good leader in part because the consensus is commanded by the leader. Right. But when you are in a blue state and and, and let's be honest, like there's, there's some purple in Maine. Right. I mean, it, it can go either way, depending on where you're at and everything else. But it's very rural. 
And the geography of politics often designates rural and then urban as being Democrat or Republican. How do you deal with that? How do you gather consensus so that maniacs are able to, you know, have a at least status quo, if not a slightly better life by the time you leave office? We have two uh, congressional districts in Maine. District one, which is primarily Southern Maine, which is primarily urban. And then the second district, which is huge, which is uh, has, except for Bangor and Orono, which are communities of 10,000 people, everything else is rural. I, I live in Lincoln, which is, has 5,000 people. I just came back from uh, gathering signatures from the, uh, the town of Lee that has uh, less than 1,000 people. So that is a picture of Maine. Maine is a rural state populated traditionally by very independent people that now have been made dependent of the government. High energy prices, high taxes, not so good education everywhere. Our youth is not prepared for the modern times because some of the people at the universities basically poo-poo anybody who goes to technical training without really understanding that not everybody has to have a college degree. If everybody had a college degree, you still have to have plumbers and carpenters with college degrees, so it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. So one of the issues we have to address is to strengthen the opportunity for the young people who can't or do not want to go to college to get a good quality technical education. And one of the things I'm going to propose that it is the university who steps in to do this. So you can come up with a technical degree, but from the University of Maine, even though we have all the colleges, we have Ivy schools in Maine, you know, it's, 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 it's a state of contrast between the poverty and, 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 the, uh, and the immense wealth and the, uh, the academic places that, that we have. But right now people have to decide whether they eat, they put gas in their car, or they pay for the fuel bill. That's not yeah. justice, that's not acceptable. But the, uh, the state legislature keep on raising taxes, keep on putting more burdens on the people, and people leave the state. Yeah, people leave the state when it gets expensive. And and uh, I still don't know how we build consensus with that, right? We, we become, you become addicted to help, outside help, and then you lose a little bit of that of that resilience that you need to develop. So that, that's a hard problem to solve. Uh, the other thing, to your point about the trades, a friend of mine has, he's now a journeyman pipe fitter. And look, it, it, it makes a lot of money. It <laughs> you is. Know, I, I, his hourly rate is high enough to he can live anywhere. And he frequently makes more than his hourly rate because the work he does as a pipe fitter is often on non standard hours, overtime hours, weekends. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of money to be made. And the path was, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy, right? These guys are incredible with what they do, but four years, four years and during the entire time he's making money. Another area where you could develop small business. Um, one of my very close people in my life likes to use the example of someone who does waxing as a profession. And if you have a full big of, book of business, I mean, look, you can go to somewhere and be in and out of there in 20 minutes and be waxed and spend 75 to 100 bucks in 15 to 20 minutes. You start doing the math on that and you realize there's hundreds of thousands of dollars in someone who does that. And this is, that is good work. I mean, that is good money for something that you're doing. Does everybody make that much money? I don't know, but you learn how to run a business. You learn how to also market other products because anybody's in the skincare industry either makes or, or sells someone else and you make more money that way. And there's a lot of resilience in that. You you were insulated from most things because you make enough money, you can save up, you can afford a house, blah, 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 blah. But we sure have a tendency to, to look down on someone like that and, and look up at someone who's got a, whatever, an English degree and never uses their English degree once. It's, it's, a, it's a real problem. It is, a, it is a real problem. It's a question of attitudes. Okay. I mean, um, a gentleman just left the house a few minutes ago fixing my furnace. He's making $90 an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. simple. But he learned the trade. No. So yeah. why can't those trades be expanded? We need to find people like him that can teach the trade and be properly certified to create more opportunity. 
If we need investment in Maine, we cannot attract investment if we don't have a well-trained workforce, and yeah. we don't. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we no longer can expect for the companies to come in, put millions of dollars, and train their force. Yeah, maybe they can specialize in, but we need to be able to offer a pool of trained people for any type uh, of activity, trade, uh, or anything like that. And I'm yeah. going to take a step backwards because I didn't completely answer your question. Thank the majority, you. The majority of the, pe of the people in Maine are purple. Okay. And surprisingly Same. enough, the number of people that don't vote, I don't know if this is a problem nationwide, but I'm, even veterans that say, I never registered to vote, I'm not going to register to vote, I don't care. And boy, you can't change their minds. Right. And uh, so whoever is going to win, we need to take a middle of the road approach, stay away from both the extreme right and the extreme left, address local issues, Mm -hmm. address what's important to them. Yeah, we can say that if I'm simpatico, the Republicans will vote for me. Hopefully enough that they will not stay home. Right. I need to talk to the independents, or here in Maine, they're not called independents. They're called no preference, which clarifies the fact that they have no political uh, leniency or convictions or whatever it is. And then we need to make some inroads with the Democrats which not all Democrats are, 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 are radical, well, the, not all Republicans are radical. So we need to, uh, to appeal to the constructive side of the Democrat uh, party. If we do that, we can win. And that's what we need to do that, that, is, that is very, very important. At some point, we're gonna get away from politics here. And I really don't wanna say policy, not politics, because I don't really wanna get into politics. But when you look at policy, there is a balance that has to be had. And us folks like me in the middle who are like, hey, I don't trust either of you guys, right? Um, we, it's easy to get lost in the party and its needs over the people and its needs. One of the things is like school choice. I, I don't know if school choice is the answer or not, but I know that it's a problem because we're not allowed to have the conversation. Like, hey, we have a parent who's like, my kid's school sucks. It's not performing up to standard. And then, you know, we're like, well, take this money and let's go get you a different school. Let's create a need for a new school, whatever it is. We can't even have that conversation because it's so politicized. That could be a great piece of policy in a given area. But we can't even have these conversations, Eric. So so how do we have these conversations about what to do with some of these social problems that really seem to be within our grasp, but always seem to be just out of our grasp, like education? Well, interestingly enough, and I'm glad you brought up the subject, there's a lot of homeschooling in Maine. Yeah. And there was a mother I approached to see if she would sign my petition to get on the ballot. He said, well, I don't know you. I don't know what you stand for. I am a mother who is homeschooling my kids. Okay. So I said, I support homeschooling and I support charter schools because there is a real need in some of the districts where... Uh, the unions have taken over the education, the parents have little say, and that's not true in every town in Maine. It goes from town to town. But I think that some of the money, the billions of dollars that we have in education should be able to give a parent the choice. If you want to homeschool, you should have some financial support because when your kid is not going to the public school, somebody else is benefiting from it and that's not fair. And then, if the consensus is to have a charter school, well, let the majority of the people decide that the uh, charter school is convenient for this community. You know, right. we have independent school boards in Maine, but this is a discussion that must be had and parents should have a choice. Especially if the curriculum, which is being challenged in a lot of areas, um, if it comes into question and we're, we're getting into areas where parents are like, hey, you're now in my turf. Now you're deciding how my kid's being parented. That doesn't make that person uh, a bad person. It makes them someone who's interested in their kid's education, and they're like, I need a different option. And if the government's going to get involved in these things, cutting a check to go to a, a different school and providing that option, that, that seems like a reasonable, uh, limited government approach to, to that particular problem. 
But again, can't have that conversation because anybody who just stands up for their kids' education and disagrees with the, whatever the school board is, all of a sudden they become a domestic terrorist. And that's, <laughs> look, can that be possible? Sure. But should we start there? No. No, 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 no. But see, for instance, one of the schools here in Maine uh, that bent to that has nine different bathrooms because there is one kid that claims he's a cat, so he has to have a cat litter to go to the bathroom. And another and another one that thinks he's a lemon. And again, kids will fall for whatever fantasy you let them go by. You know, my comment to the parent I talked to a while ago that was complaining about the... Uh, uh, the bathroom for, for the kid who thinks he's a cat. I said, well, simple solution is having clean it. That may cure him from it. And uh, But, you know, we're, we're going in what is known as the, the theater of the absurd. And why should we continue to let things go to an extreme where we, we will always recover? We're a great nation with great people, uh, but we cannot go into too many excesses because one thing we have to keep in mind all great empires fall from within. Mm. And we are at risk right now with some of the extreme issues that we could be in risk of collapsing and not from the Chinese and not from the Russians. Kind of illustrating the point tangentially, I'm going to use a, a Jordan Peterson example because he drives people crazy. But he's not wrong about this. There's a balance that we have to get. Back to the balance thing, right? You can't cater, you can't hold the water and cater for corporations and expect to have a long term pos positive outcome. There has to be some kind of reining in and some attention to, to the populace. And usually that's done through the government as a check for that. On the other side, you can't let the government get so addicted to tax money that the only answer is more money, more money, more money. And, and that definitely has to happen. So, how do we strike that balance? While we also strike another balance, if we're going to go side to side, now we're going to go front and back of, again, rural and urban, um, I think mean, individual versus, so like, like, okay, people struggle with this concept and I don't hardly ever get a good answer, but I believe you, you're going to have to be able to talk about this. Diversity is awesome. Diversity is the opposite of unity. And so you have to balance on diversity and unity. Yes, we want to be diversified. Yes, we want to. But we have to be able to say, if you're a lemon and you need a specific bathroom, is that going to create a greater good for the population? Yes or no? We don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I don't want to be intolerant. I want to listen. But we have to be able to have that conversation because this is all balances, right? So individual versus group, left versus right, corporations versus government, all of these things require attention. And somehow we kind of managed to do it. But what are your thoughts in general on striking these multiple balances? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting thing because, you know, our constitution says that we, we are all created equal. So our diversity is what brings us together. You know, I remember when I first joined the army, we used to make fun of everything and everybody without the intent of insulting anyone. You know, I was a taco vendor. The other guy was a guinea, was this. But we all had fun doing it. We only insulted somebody when we were mad, but we didn't call them by, by their ethnic names because that was not the case. Now you have to run for cover every time somebody says this and says that. And, of course, the line of final defense of the people who are ignorant is to call you racist. Right. Because racist is the argument of somebody who has nothing intelligent to say. But we try to run from it. And that's not the case. The yeah. motto of the United States is a pluribus unum. Right. From many, one. And precisely, we're a nation of immigrants. And right now we look in the limelights. The majority of a lot of the people who are CEOs, who are in Congress with this, are not necessarily of European, Central European or origin. We have Eastern European, we have people from Pakistan, from India, we have people that came from Northern Africa, and uh, from Latin America, and they're all important people in the country. So what are what is it that we're arguing about yeah. when... Uh, you know, you have people like uh, that Polish quarterback on San Francisco who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and he decided being a millionaire that he was going to protest for inequality 
where he is the most unequal of all because he's beyond privilege. Yeah. But we're paying attention to that nonsense. We, we, we have to, as you say, we need to get back to a balance where we can have an intelligent discussion of things, make sure everybody has an equal opportunity, which is what our, what our constitution establishes. And when somebody is denied the equal opportunity, that's when both society and the law come in to protect, but not to overprivilege to the point that you are a protected group. Because as protected groups are created, eventually we'll have everybody in a minority. So even the so-called white men will be a minority. So, so become a protected group. So, so we're taking an absurd path mm. to inequality and not to equality. One of the things too, then this is just an inescapable truth. Someone in our Congress, their background is that they are a black female, actual African, refugee, Islamic, signals, and I'll just say, probably an anti-Semite, and they're able to be in Congress and get reelected. Like, if that's not diversity, like, exemplified, there it is. Someone who, like, who causes a lot of, of consternation because of their views and everything else, and then there that person is in Congress representing her people repeatedly. I, I think that's that's a great... You don't have to agree with the politics of it, but you have to say... That is a mark of a nation that is able to tolerate something that I gave a lot of list of things that apparently we all hate. But, but this I, particular I person, what is the most important thing about this person? She's totally intolerant. <laughs> I was trying to not say anything. Tolerance to brought her into office. Now she's intolerant. She's trying to destroy everything. But that brings us to another female that when she was elected senator from California, she celebrated that she was the first Indian senator in the United States. And suddenly from one day to the next, she went from Indian to black. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's a wonderful transformation. It, it, it's insulting. It's insulting, honestly, when that, I mean, look, she's my, she was my senator for a long time, never felt represented. I mean, talk God about being disenfranchised, you know, in my district, um, we're very purple. We're very, very, if you want to win, you have to, you have to deal with the middle. You have to. And um, I, I mean, I don't feel represented for sure. And, and I don't know that there's any change in that. I'm probably pretty hard to represent. But when you come to me and you bring ethnicity into it first, and then you mm -hmm. change your ethnicity, and sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. I just, I, I struggle, Eric, I struggle to take that seriously. I, I struggle to take, and I'll just name Lindsey Graham as my example. I struggle to take him seriously. He's from, he's from your side of the aisle. Um, that guy's a blowhard, a whole bunch of talking, not a whole lot of acting. <laughs> and, and so I'm really, frankly, I think America in general, we're sick of that. We're sick of Congress at the national level just letting us down. I mean, Congress always, even, even more than Trump, always trends negative worse than any other, certainly, like, certainly worse than SCOTUS, certainly worse than the president, no matter who's sitting there. They're always worse than that. I think we're just fed up with it. Why don't we act on it? Well, the years I lived in Washington, I used, I used to tell people, uh, Washington is surrounded by a road called the Beltway. <laughs> and so there is there is a magic aura that when you bring a straightforward issue to Washington, the moment it crosses the Beltway, it gets completely distorted in any possible way you can. So you can't deal in Washington with real issues. They're fantasies yeah. created by the convenience of the people and then we have another problem, the Washington mm. bureaucracy. Most of the people who live in Washington are bureaucrats, and it is in their interest to have the federal government grow and grow and grow. And I was witness of that one time when I audited a part of the defense accounting system. Oh, and boy. when I did that audit, one of the, my findings was that uh. this particular office was so inefficient that they reorganized every six months, they created new positions, and never accounted for the money properly. And one of the things I brought up is that they brushed under the table, just because they were lazy, $1 billion of the Navy's budget. Of course, the Navy budget is so big that who cares about a billion dollars, right? Well, we the taxpayers should care. And going back to the point you were saying, one of my themes now in Maine is very simple. The more government we have, 
the less liberty we have. We have to measure that regardless of what our political leanings are, we need to understand that every new regulation, every new law, every new tax gives the government greater power over us. And as long as we accept it, we are giving up our liberties. And it's not a joke. It is very serious if we look at it that way. So we have to measure how much yeah. do we want government to really do. Because even Jefferson, who's founder of the Democrat Party, said a famous phrase, he who governs least governs best. And we're not there. We're not there. No, no, we're not. We're also, we, in the next, uh, at one o'clock, I'm going to have on Stuart Scheller and Matt Ho, who, who both stood up and said, enough is enough. And I'm looking for accountability from above because the things we're doing, in this case, in Afghanistan, uh, are not going the way we want them to go. Uh, and I'm going to pick squarely on the, the Joe Biden uh, administration right now. We've seen this crew of people absolutely F up what they're supposed to do internationally, whether it's State Department, Department of Defense. Just, there's a whole bunch of people who have repeatedly failed at this, right? So and there's no accountability. Right, there's no accountability. No, right? Nobody got yeah. fired. So if you make bad policies, a politician, okay, there's accountability in that you might not get reelected, but there's a whole lot of politicians that seem to get reelected. And, and okay, maybe it's term limits is the answer. I don't know. That's just a different problem. But why don't we elect out? I, I'm glad to elect against any or vote against any incumbent. Why are we so reluctant to take charge and go, hey, what you said you were going to do did not work. Buh, bye. Go home. We're the voters. It's up to us, but if we're too lazy not to, to ask for accountability. You know, yeah. Churchill said something. We attributed to Churchill, but it is it's true. What is the difference between a statesman and a politician? A politician is worried about the next election. A statesman is worried about the next generation. If we can ask that question of the people running for office, we may be electing better people. Yeah. Let's let's back the scope out a little bit. Let's talk a little more internationally. When you, I'm very much a, the government isn't to be trusted. Uh, the government will typically design something that solves problem A, and they will actually ultimately exacerbate problem A. You know, like if we're trying to get rid of uh, hungry people, no, no one will starve in America again. The government will create a program that creates more people out of starving. That's just how these things go, because it's hard to solve these. These aren't easy problems to solve, and it's in everybody's defense. I got that because I've watched us go abroad and do a terrible job. I've been in other countries where things like policing up trash is not possible, right? And so you see these things and you realize how much we already have accomplished here and how fortunate we are to be here. I know you have a similar thing. I mean, you've, you've seen revolution, you know, firsthand. So your travels abroad, when you look around, are, are there other systems that we should be emulating? Are there other systems that we should be rejecting? Let's not get too wrapped up in, in like, you know, Venezuela is bad, okay? But, but let's, let's be smart about this. Like, where, where are we lacking and where are we ahead? Well, a couple of days ago, the Wall Street Journal quoted uh, Justice Breyer. And he was quoted in Washington. He was quoted in Lincoln. And he said, we are an experiment. We are an experiment in democracy. And as Winston Churchill said, democracy is a very bad form of government. However, we have not seen something better yet. So yeah. we need to understand, we are an experiment, but we have to be engaged. If we're not mm -hmm. engaged, then whatever happens is, um, as, that's what we tell the people who are not registered to vote or don't vote. Don't complain. You have no right to complain because you have to accept whatever is handed to you. But yeah. then if you're going to vote, we have to do our homework and not vote for somebody because male, female, purple, black, yellow, uh, pretty. Lemon, no. cat. <laughs> Tell me something intelligent so I can vote for you. And, and, and then that, that becomes very important. And uh, so... Still, I have lived in Germany, in Africa, in almost every country in Latin America, and uh, it's always good to be home. No matter what pro many problems we have here, still, 
we have the best country, but we are on a way of taking it apart. And that's what we have to be very careful of, that uh, we, we don't give away the farm trying to do things that are not in, for the best of every single American. It's interesting. Uh, I agree with you. And when I come home, I, I love it. And there's certain things that I do like other countries manage to pull off. Uh, the unity of some places, that's better mm. than ours. Yeah. The, um, we, we overwork. We work way too hard. Our work-life balance is, is ridiculous compared to other places that do pretty damn well. We, we've got to work on that. But um, all in all, you're right. It's pretty damn good here. I, I want to get on my soapbox for a minute and just look straight at the camera and say this. If you think voting is enough, you're wrong. Freedom is way, way, way too hard to maintain if you're not going to be involved. And I'm not talking to you, Dickie. I mean, I saw your comment earlier. I'm just saying in general, get involved in your government. Voting is the least you can do. You don't want to vote. Okay, that's great. That's fine. And, and complain all you want. But go do something else. You can go sit on any, any any county, any city, any borough, any district commission, and you can get you can vote every time you guys meet multiple times. You can decide on the issues that will end up on the ballot. You can be ahead of the ballot. You can absolutely do all that stuff. You don't have to get elected. You just go ask and say, "Hey, where can I help in the government?" You can do that. Anybody can, and and that's a way to truly get involved. And at the local level, you're really making bigger changes. You're deciding where the money's going to be at. You're deciding how you're competing for different money for different projects. All these blah blah on and on and on. And the people you sit across from are, are your neighbors. Maybe they're your county neighbor. Maybe they're not in your city. But whatever. But they're not going to be like you. And you're going to look around. You're going to be like, "How do we make the best decision as this small group?" And all of a sudden, party goes out the door. And you really can have an impact. If we all, Eric, if we all took some of our precious, precious time, I don't know, 10 hours a month, two hours a month, one hour a month, and we said, I'm going to be involved in the government, and I'm going to find a way to roll up my arms and help, not not inculcate, but to actually get to work, we'd be a better place. Absolutely. And there is an old saying that I quote myself. Every people have the government they deserve. That's right. Yeah. And the one you earn. If you don't yeah. like, if you don't put time into it, it will absolutely. If you don't vote, yeah. you have to accept what's there. If you vote, you have to accept winning and losing. Uh, and, and that's the name of the game. But you have to participate. You've got to get involved to fight for what you think is best for you and your community. Right. And your, your political adversary can still be your neighbor, can still be your friend. You don't have to agree on the means. You don't have to agree on the ways. You agree on that. We all want basically the same things. I've learned that a lot too. You go to Iraq where there's struggle and strife everywhere. Every parent there fears cancer. They all want their kid to be okay. They all just want to be able to survive. I mean, that's a universal norms. And Iraq is a totally different place, way less stable than here. So, so we can do a better job at these things. I keep a cartoon from the 2016 election, which I think basically encapsulates what you just said. He said, Johnny is married to Mary. Johnny voted for Trump. Mary voted for Hillary. Johnny and Mary are married and they love each other. And that's yeah. it. Very that's it. differences outside yeah. there, but you know, we have to get along. I have many friends from any possible uh, political inclination, and sometimes we argue, sometimes we don't, but we're friends. And that's something, for instance, in Mexico, I had a friend who was an important person in one party, and he changed parties. So suddenly, nobody would speak to him. Hmm. Why? Oh, because he's... No, that's absurd. When you actually create a divide in a community because you belong to a different party, that's not only absurd, it's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. Tolerance goes a long way, and tolerance isn't supposed to be easy. It's like charity. It's hard. It's hard to be tolerant because the things that you that that push your in, that your tolerance, the things that will challenge your tolerance are things that you want to be intolerant towards, and so like that's where the nexus is between the good you and the bad you. But if you bring that point up to someone, uh, you often hear, well, I don't tolerate Nazis. Like, oh, OK, great. Go round up all the Nazis that are left in the world and <laughs> we'll have a conversation. I mean, exactly. let's not be. Yeah, let's not start there. OK, we want to find the things we can't tolerate. OK, great. Yeah. Child child diddling. 
we don't want that. However, those people get out of jail and now have to re reenter into society. Now you have to tolerate them a little bit. So there is a tolerance element to these things. So how do we force ourselves to be tolerant as a norm? And if you're going to make a mistake, Pete would say, make a mistake by being too tolerant, too accepting, too focused on love and get burned doing that because that's going to pay the bills way more often than the times when you don't make it through. I'm not saying be a rube. I'm not saying be taken advantage of, right? But if you default to tolerance and grace as your norm, I would say that overall your interactions are going to be better and you're going to be more contributing to the wellness of all people. Well, and the important thing is my father used to say, we were born with two eyes, two ears, uh, and one yeah. mouth. We need to use them proportionally, and we don't. We need to learn to listen, to see, to understand, and, uh, and then speak only when we have something intelligent to say. You'd be surprised how often conversations die. We don't want conversations to die, but mm. we, we want conversations because, on the other hand, if we don't have the loyal opposition, if the Democrats take control of the country or Republicans take control of the country, we're going to be corrupt in one generation, totally. Yeah. If we do yeah. not have a balance between the parties, win some, lose some, uh, change this way, uh, we, we're, we're headed down the, the path of the dinosaurs. Consider this, I, my representative, um, I've twice emailed this person and never gotten any kind of positive interaction from them. That's not what I would call representation. I've had people who, who tell me that my representative is great. And I'm like, well, here's a problem right here. That's not great. Not being mm -hmm. able to communicate to your constituents. And then that, well, you don't understand single mom. She's busy. And I'm like, not too busy to do your damn job. If you can't handle it and you can't staff yourself and you can't handle legitimate requests from your constituents, how can I vote for that person? How can we look at that and say, that's greatness. And then in the, in the face of actual evidence that it's not greatness, you know, someone's going to stand who, and it's not their representative. They're going to say, no, no, you, you're wrong. I'm like, all right. I mean, I don't care about party. I care about action. Like, are you a mm -hmm. good person? I trust well, that you will make, you know, you'll make good judgments. You don't have to be from a party. I'm not from a party. Just do a good job. But if you can't at the base level communicate with your constituents, We've got a real problem with, with your once ability to represent. Once yeah. you're elected, you have to represent everybody, not just the people from your party. Right. Because you, you were elected to represent all of the people, not just the ones that voted for you. And so if somebody gets elected mm. to something as a single mom or a single dad, they have a staff. Yeah. And they have the same responsibility to every citizen, to every constituent, regardless of what that constituent thinks about the politics. And, and I'll just say this too, being a single mom is not an attribute of a politician. It's not something that you say, this is what I am. I mean, great, but I don't know why that matters. You could be a family of 10 and you can go out and run office. It you doesn't could be matter. Yeah. That, was just, that was just a dumb excuse. Right. <laughs> Right. And if you're telling me that they're so busy with their kids, they can't do their job, then maybe they need a different job. Either way, with that said, I am going to reach out to this person because I do have a national representative level problem that I'd like to bring up to uh, my representative and, and you know, say, hey, listen, there's a problem. And it's in the VA. And you, you and I both know the VA continues to be something that we have to struggle with and deal with. They do a great job in so many ways, but the system is overwhelmed. And uh, I keep continuing to have to fight the same fight and not get the care that I'm supposed to get, that the, the nation says I'm supposed to get. I wonder if I'll get a response. And I shouldn't wonder that. I should know, like, absolutely, this is a legitimate thing that requires her attention. And she can absolutely point to some of her staff and say, I want you to you know, pen a letter and say, what is going on over here? Because if it's happening to me, and by the way, when I talk to the VA, they all go, hey, it's happening everywhere. Um, if it's happening everywhere, well, I want the federal congressional members to know that, to so be like, hey, check up time. We're going to go and we're going to hold people accountable. We're going to rebut, whatever it is, right? They can do their policy thing. But the base of this whole thing, Eric, is that I don't trust that this person will take a single action because they've been incapable of even interacting with me. That's the problem right there. Because, you know, I, I'm a disabled veteran. And uh, I hadn't paid attention to that until I became commander of the American Legion in Mexico. 
and my outgoing commander, a friend of a long time, he says, you better check yourself into the VA, register, and wow, it's been amazing. The changes in the VA in the last eight years are fantastic, but also for those who are veterans who are listening, who haven't bothered to check with the VA to see if there's anything medical or they need, be it through the several American veterans, the American Legion, the VFW, we have what we call case officers, people that understand every single veteran, and they will sit with you. They will check your, your background, and they will identify if there's something that you need because of some disability or something that happened while you were in the service. Early, earlier today, we were talking to a Navy veteran who is retired from the private sector. He's very happy, didn't want to bother to go to VA, and uh, he was a, a, an engine man in the Navy. Right. And I said, how's your hearing? And his wife quickly said, he can't hear. I said, well, you know, that's yeah. a service-connected disability. Right. If you go to the VA, they may not give you a penny for hearing, but they will give you hearing aids. Yeah. You know, so, so there's a lot of positive interaction but the congressmen or the congresspeople staff should know those processes. And, of course, the rest of us are there to help. Yeah, yeah. And the problem that I'm facing, again, not an uncommon problem. It's not a peak problem. This is a, a system problem. And the system keeps kicking out this null value. And I'm like, hey, 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 I'll go back to step one. But why am I going back to step one? We should be on <laughs> step five. I should be getting care. And But you're, okay, we'll go back to step one. But if I, I've seen this error several times now, it shouldn't happen once. Okay, great. But it shouldn't happen every time. Anyhow, let's, let's not get distracted by that. Uh, you've got a lot of incredible stories. I would like a no shit. There I was story where you talk about something incredible that you saw that would make us struggle to believe it, whether it's action based or, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, you must have so many things because you've been all over the world and doing things. Well, um, you posed a difficult question. I got to come up with, uh, Take your time. With, 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 with something. But here goes the story. My, my job in Uganda was a contract to oversee the government contracts of the Ugandan government to eliminate corruption in the process with an understanding that the members of parliament are entitled to bid on government contracts. And the press in Uganda was always like everywhere else, yakking, 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 yakking about corruption. And, and, and then we're attacking my credibility and my company because of what we were doing. And our job was to simply simplify the process and show where the traps were. And I was able to find several traps. For instance, the Coffee Institute of Uganda was operating in an old building that had a uh, an infrastructure for an elevator, but they put an extra floor on it, and then they put a bid for an elevator. So when that came to me, I said, okay, who is the structural engineer? Well, I couldn't get an answer. Finally, eventually I got who was the contractor, no. They never told them that they were going to put another elevator, so they just put a wall that would have never held an elevator, but they had already bought it. So that would have caused some deaths. But where am I going with the story? I finally sat down with the press, and I said, people, you have no idea what you're talking about. I am going to give you a one-day seminar on what I do, how I do it, and how you can really look for corruption in government purchases, because otherwise you're accomplishing nothing except selling noise. So we had a very good session. I had a good a good relationship with the press. They still attacked me. I didn't care. One thing I asked, do they shoot people here? No, they just hit you with a newspaper. I said, I don't care. I can I can handle that. But you know, that that was a that was a very interesting thing that the press had no idea what they were doing, but they were doing it. So hopefully that contributed a little bit to a better perspective because one of the problems in that African country is a lot of the European countries give tons and tons of money and nobody accounts for it. 
the uh, government of Spain gave him $3 million to finish the building of Social Security that wasn't finished. It cost $1 million to finish it. And the other $2 million were divided between the Spanish contractors and the people of Uganda. When they came to me, I said, okay, here's one thing I can't do anything about because I can only look for Uganda money. This money was from Spain. Spain is happy to give it away, but at least understand where the traps are. I, uh, I have 15 stories just like that, like where you just see like the same kind of, of uh, you know, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. I, I want to um, I want to give you the chance to ask me a question. We don't really ever get to talk very much. But before we, before we do that, uh, I want to mention we belong to a group of, of people. And there's a lot of high level conversations and, and thinking and book reading. And it's just one of those like collegial kind of environments that, that I just I love so much. And if you want to kind of see what we do, the guy that started this whole thing is a guy named Josh Trevino. And he's built this sub stack called, uh, it's the Plaza de Armas. It's, it's called Armas. And if you just go to armas.co, that's his sub stack. Or just type in Josh Trevino sub stack. I'm telling you right now, I think it's worth the money to sign up for his sub stack. I don't get paid anything to say this. Josh is my friend. <laughs> But I just love the way he writes. I love the work that he does. I wanted to make sure I promoted him. And I'm going to do that some more because I like to see other folks get a chance to read what he does. Because there's some really incredible minds in this group that he built. And and Eric, obviously, is one of them. Uh, Eric's LinkedIn profile is probably the best way to kind of get close to where he's at. He does a lot of things. He does a lot of speaking publicly. He does a lot of speaking on media. And so that's probably the best place to kind of connect with him if you're interested in more about what Eric does. If you want to support the Break It Down show, you can. here's the best way to do it. Go to breakitdownshow.com, upper left-hand corner. One of the first things you see is the PayPal link. Go in there and just create yourself a subscription. Five bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks a month. All of that money goes right back into the show. And that's how I, I keep the show alive. The show costs money. And I would say, yeah, a thousand bucks a month or so to put this show out. So if you like what I do, man, 10 bucks a month would go a long, long way to help me get out of the tent, go on the road and go get you even more people. I would love to be in Maine sitting across from Eric having this conversation. So that, that's my pitch for me is just do that PayPal thing. And, and you hear me say this a lot, but I don't need Patreon. I need you. I need you. You and me will work this out. You want something from me. You want you like, hey, part of my subscription, I want you to come by my house and have dinner. Great. I'll do that. Whatever it is, don't, I don't need more work to do. I just want to support what you guys want to do. I know a lot of you like what I do, so that's how you can support me. Eric, uh, any questions for me? Any final thoughts? Well, how did you become a uh, link with Joshua? I spoke on um, combat stuff at a group. There's a, Boyd, uh, there's a group called Boyd and Beyond. And they, they studied uh, Colonel Boyd's work. He was an Air Force guy who talked about OODA loops, that kind of thing. You probably heard the name before. And we all uh, wrote papers and we would present the papers. And so for two years in a row, I had papers that I wrote. And I met Josh at one and he's like, hey, what you guys are talking about is nobody else is talking about. It. It's important. You should keep going, keep doing it. And so that was it. Now it's probably in 2013, maybe 2000, now probably, I think 2013, where I met him. And uh, I just, can't say enough great things about him. He makes me think. He writes like a demon. And I just, um, I love it. And then he started this plaza group on Facebook. And then it transitioned over to the, the other place where we're at. And I, I just, uh, I get so much out of it. I'm always like amazed. Like, I'm in this group. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm in this group, there are some know? incredible people. You know, oh my he, God. Reached out, he reached out intellectually to my wife. So she invited him to, to dinner in Mexico City. That's, that's how I met Joshua. And I do admire his, his work, his thinking. And I just remember something. Originally, we were going to talk about Ulysses Grants. We haven't touched him. Oh, my God. We totally, yeah, we totally skipped. That. Okay, well, Grant's still dead. He'll still be around. We'll still talk about him. You're just going to have to come back and do it then. Yeah, but I'll just make a pitch for it. 200th anniversary of one of the greatest presidents, along with Lincoln and Washington, that's been forgotten. We need to revive his memory because among the many things that he did, if he had not been for him, the Civil War would have been a waste because Reconstruction, good or bad, would have never happened under President right. Johnson. So let's yeah. leave that as a thought for another invitation. I'm always down to talk about Grant. He's a, such a complex dude, and you're right. Uh, it'll give me time to go back through his incredible autobiography. 
All right. Well, I, th- I guess that's it. a little love note to Josh at the end. I love I've kind of been meaning to do that. I always try to keep him on the download because that's kind of where he wants to stay. But now that he's public on Substack, go support Josh Armas.co on Substack. Josh Trevino, you will not regret reading his work. It is incredible. And the group of people he's put together, also incredible. Eric, anything else? No, I think uh, we've done plenty of very interesting conversations today. Next time, I will query you about your military experience Got so it. we can cross-check notes. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and uh, hopefully we have contributed something to the thinking of your audience. Stand by. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank